rose today a major item in the public discourse of our country. And I think properly so. Its significance in our life is obvious. It's a matter of convenience and also, of course, it's a very important tool of economic growth and development. We're opening up the country, making transport of goods and services and of people much easier. But I believe they've become a big issue because of some of the claims that have been made. I remember the famous claim that was made that I was, I was verbally slapped. Unprecedented infrastructure development was the words of my opponent. And when I had the temerity to say that I, didn't, I was traveling all over the country and I had not seen it, I was told that I was asleep in the back of my car. And that is why I didn't see it. But then what I discovered when I came into office was exactly what I, I knew when I was in opposition. Every place I went to in these last three years, and it's still going on up to today, the first comment of the chiefs, of opinion leaders, of everybody, Nana Yakwain. Many, many places as you're passing through the town, they point to you. Even when your window is open, you can see them making the gesture. You see how. So you then know that the infra unprecedented infrastructure development really didn't exist anywhere other than in the Green Book, but it didn't live on the ground. So that we have this major burden that we have to discharge, how to bring our roads up to scratch. We're spending a lot of money on it. This year alone, spending over two billion CDs in paying contractors and giving them the wherewithal to begin the road, to, to do the work. And I'm very, very confident that the 2020 commitment to it being the year of roads is going to see a significant amount of road expansion and development in the country. We are not going to be in a position to deal with all the roads in Ghana. We don't have that much money. We're not going to be able to deal with it. That's a, a reality all of us have to accept. But we will make a good fist of dealing with some of the most significant and systematically as our circumstances improve be able to deal with the rest. But the country will witness a significant expansion of the road infrastructure, rehabilitation of the road infrastructure in the course of this next year, which we have dubbed the Year of Roads. I have a big problem. I have so many notes which will have me sitting here all morning doing all the talking and crowding you out. So very soon, I'll leave it. And what I can't say, you may be able to ask me, and hopefully I'll be able to, to respond to some of them. But let me just say one or two other things. I think an important development that took place this year in our governance structure was the reorganization of the regions that took place. Unfortunately for us, there was a strong national consensus that the time had come for us to look at again, especially the demands that people were making, that they felt that they would be more, they felt that it would be more effective for them if the regional uh, organization of the country took place. And it did take place. And it took place with strong popular support. So that from 10, we've been able to come to 16 regions. And that took place and it was facilitated by the fact that there was a strong national consensus. The major political parties, opinion leaders, traditional rulers, all of us were united that this exercise had to be done. And as a result, the difficult constitutional thresholds that there were in the Constitution 
40% turnout, 80% yes vote. We were able to meet it because there was a strong consensus. I had hoped that the consensus that was present that enabled us to create these six additional regions would carry over to the reform of our local governance system. I believed and I continue to believe that the time has come for us to accept the reality of multi-party involvement in local governance. Accept the reality. I don't believe there's anybody who's active in the politics of Ghana who is not aware that local government elections are highly partisan. Despite the language of non-partisan in the Constitution, they are highly partisan. And in the course of the debate on this matter, if you followed the proceedings in the House and had that, I mean, that was the common ground that was there on both sides of the House, that the time had come for us to strip away the hypocrisy, look at the reality, and deal with it, and find a way. Uh, and I, I continue to be baffled by this, the, the, the situation in this matter. At the national level, party politics seems to be working. Ghana has an, a history in these last 25, 26 years. We've had three changes of government through the ballot box in this country. Yes, there have been moments of tension in these exercises, but at the end of the day, we have been able as a people to use the ballot box to change government and on a multi-party basis. The last change is the one that brought me to this house. And it hasn't been done and threatened the, the integrity of our state or its stability. And as I can see, party politics has been a very important instrument in heightening public accountability in our country. Because it has made possible free expression and apart from everything else also, to allow people to associate for public purposes. You will join the parties of your choice. Nobody's forcing anybody to join any party. We do so as a voluntary act because we share common views, common values. We're saying that that is all right for the national level, but at the local level, somehow or other, it becomes a pestilence. And yet, the national expression of multi-party democracy takes place at the local level. The very same people who are going to elect the DCs were the people who, are going, who vote for MPs. And they do it with ease. Every four years, nobody has any difficulty from Abomusu or Yinam or any of those places from where I come from in going to the ballot box and deciding they want to vote for Nana as against that. Why? So why would they have such a difficulty in voting for their district chief? But anyway, alas, the very important constituency in this country despite the apparent appearance of, uh, oh my goodness, of, uh, yes, I think you know what it is. <laughs> so, but anyway, just to explain that it was because of this absence of consensus that I decided to call off the referendum. I don't believe, and I still don't believe, that no matter what the prospects are, a matter like this involving the revision or amendment of an entrenched clause of the Constitution should be a party-driven affair. The one party will come, change an entrenched provision of the Constitution against the wish of another party, and that party, when it has its turn in government, will then take us through the same pr pr proposal to replace it or re uh, uh, restore it. I don't think that that is the way, that, that, that's the kind of ping pong we want to play with our constitution. And it is the reason why I decided to call it off that. We were going to have a yes or no on party lines on such an insensitive and important. The way we call it off and we continue to work on the consensus and hopefully when that consensus is, is solid and on the ground, we can then, um, begin to uh, revisit the matter. 
I need to say a couple of things about uh, the AFCFTA. We should all remember uh, and have in mind the significance of this development. The African Continental Free Trade Area is one of the most important decisions that has been taken at the continental level about the future of the continent. And it is an extremely, uh, it's extremely important that we Ghanaians embrace the whole idea. We should. Our history is there as our guide. We have been very much in the front of the whole Pan-African project in Ghana, right from the time of our first leader through up till today. The Pan-African project in many ways has been a Ghanaian project. So now that there's a consensus about the way forward in developing the abilities and um, potential of the continent, the AFCFTA is something that I want to recommend very much to the people and to business interests in our country, especially now that we have been given the privilege of hosting the Secretariat here. We have a major problem confronting us on our borders, the possibility of infiltration of Ghana by terrorist groups who are now actively operating in, in our border countries. specifically in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is our northern neighbor. And events there obviously can have an immediate impact on what we're doing here. It has meant the need for us to strengthen our security and intelligence agencies. We're responsible for the Accra Initiative. It was here, that it was the idea of the security and intelligence agencies of Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, and Burkina Faso make meeting regularly to share information and plan how to deal with this issue of terrorist infiltration in the Sahel region was born. So it's called the Accra Initiative. We found it necessary to strengthen our military deployment in the northern and northeastern sections of the country. All of it to try and make sure that the infection that is taking place north of our country doesn't become part of our reality. Very, very happy to see that the year of return program that I launched in Washington last October is having such great resonance. We're expecting a lot, a lot of people have already come. There are lots and lots, of, I mean, in the hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be coming also between now and the end of the year. Uh, I'm hoping that our infrastructure and our arrangements will be able to handle and deal with it. But it, it has also meant a big boost to our uh, rev tourist revenues. It's something which is my big regret at the beginning of this year, one of them, of course, was the abduction of the, and killing of the, the four girls in Takrani. Fortunately, I think the police, at the end of the day, were able to do a good job in locating, identifying their remains. There's still some controversy with one or two of the families about it, but it's something that I'm hoping we can find closure to as soon as possible. It's a matter of great regret to me that we've had to, to deal with it. So these are some of the thoughts I wanted to share with you. It appears that I've spoken for an hour. I wanted to speak for half an, half an hour. But um, I'm hoping you have enough material there to whet your appetite for the rest of our engagement. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, sir. Please take a seat, sir. Mr. President, we're grateful for those remarks, and we're going to go straight into the question and answer segment. We will be um, doing our best to take the questions in batches of five. Batches of five, you please put up your hand, and we will invite you to the podium uh, and take them in batches of um, five. Momentarily, we would wait for our colleagues to take a seat. Can we have one microphone in the center aisle? We'll use the one microphone in the center aisle. 
Can we have one microphone in the center aisle, please? Um, yes. Sami, uh, please, please step up. Um, Ghana Television, I see Ghana Television here. Adele, um, Sewa, um, the Chief, please step up. So these are the first five. I hope I've got the count right. One, two, three, four, five, yes. Let's take these first five questions. Sorry. Sorry. Let me encourage you also to keep your questions as simple as possible so that we can have a lot more of your colleagues ask uh, their questions. Yes, go ahead, Sami. Please good introduce afternoon. yourself properly. My name is Sami Riafe. I work with City FM and City TV. So, brother, many have said that your government could have handled the banking crisis in a better way without people losing their jobs. Because we are told of how um, millions of cities or billions of cities were injected into the sector to protect the, the deposit of investors. Do you agree that the government could have handled it in a better way without people losing their jobs? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sami. Moment. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My name is Abdulhai Moumen. I work with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. And this morning, you have told us about the expansion of the economy under your watch. You have told us also about the reduction of the deficit from under your watch. You have told us also about the reduction of the deficit from about 93 to 5.4%. However, uh, in the point of view of the ordinary Ghanaian, Mr. President, um, the cost of fuel continues to go up. The cost of uh, cement, for example, continues to go up. And uh, the impression people have is the fact that the dollar continues to go up while the city depreciates. In 2016, you promised to deal with the fall of the city. It's 2019, and the city is performing abysmally at 5.6 against the, the, the dollar. Mr. President, what are you doing about the city and its depreciation? So the Thank question you. is about the depreciation of the city. Yes. May I please encourage colleagues, let's get to the point so that many others can ask their questions. Do a few more? Yes, Adele. Adele Kwesi Majdu from Metro TV. Uh, Mr. President, during the electioneering uh, period in 2016, a major campaign promise you made was to ensure the provision of uh, ambulances for uh, the various constituencies. Uh, we are in the year of our law 2019, and uh, though some ambulances have been uh, purchased, they are comfortably parked at the forecourt of uh, Parliament House. And, uh, yet to be disputed to the various constituencies, although uh, the ratio of uh, ambulance to the people, citizen in the country is one to 520,000, uh, with only 55 ambulances operating in the country. Um, when, Mr. President, can you justify uh, the reason for this, and when will the others uh, also be brought into the country for uh, onward distribution? Thank you. And by the way, Mr. President, nice shirts. <laughs> yes, sir, well, let's hear you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Sewa here. I work with GH1 TV under the EIB network. The size of your government has come under a lot of scrutiny, with many insisting that the numbers of your ministers and appointees are just too high for a country of our size. Do you still stand by your earlier decision that you need these numbers to govern the country, or Will you heed to the calls and reduce them? And my last question, very brief. Um, I'm sure that you know that uh, policy think tank Imani Africa has given your government a scorecard of 48% with regard to the fulfillment of your campaign promises. Um, per the assessment, it means that you have fulfilled less than half of the promises you made to the people of Ghana. How would you assess your own self with regard to the promises that you made to us in 2016. Thank you. Oh, it's five. Yes, it's five. And colleagues, we would encourage you to stick to one question so that we can take a lot more. So, Chief, you hold on for us. We'll do you during the next batch. Thank you, Mr. President.
Well, let me go back. I mean, it's easier to deal with the the money scorecard. I disagree with the four paying promises that have been delivered and are being delivered. The figure that we're working with is a figure of 72%, not 48%, in terms of the promises that have been delivered and those that are in the course of being delivered. So we have a fundamental disagreement on the, the figures. We believe that there's enough information that can be assembled to show that our figure, our assessment, is the, is the accurate one. The size of government, I heed the cause. It's come from some quarters. I'm not quite sure that it is necessarily the call of everybody. But I believe that the output would have been difficult with a smaller number. The machinery of government in our country is such that if the political direction at the top is not strong, the delivery becomes a, 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 an issue. And I, be, I still stand by the fact that the numbers were necessary for the work that we have done. And that when you look at the output, it would have been difficult to have obtained that output without the numbers. The ambulances. The Minister for Special Development Initiatives who's been responsible for bringing them told me about a month, six weeks ago, that some of the ambulances were in, should she distribute it? And I said, no, she shouldn't. She should wait till they all come in. So one day we can distribute them all at the same time to all 275 constituencies. I saw myself getting into a tremendous amount of issues if you started distributing some and others didn't get it. Fortunately for us, all of them will be in by the end of this month. 160 odd are already in, and the balance are on the high seas will be here by the end of the month. The 300 will be there. On the 6th of January, I will commission them, and then the distribution will take place simultaneously across the country, and nobody's going to accuse me of favoritism, regionalism, this and that and that. So that is, 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 is the short answer to your question. There's no justification from being, being parked there. But if I was to send a couple here, a note here, I think you know the kind of uh, uh, discourse that would come. So the rate of decline in the CD. Well, first of all, the rate of decline of the, the depreciation of the CD is much slower than what we saw in the past. That in itself is not a sufficient, uh, it, it's not necessarily the full comfort that we want. All of us are affected by this matter of the sea. But there are structural problems that we don't talk enough about as far as the currency is concerned. And it is time for us to do so. Yes, I believe that the management of the, of the currency in our time has been much more effective than the period before we came. Don't have any doubt about that. There's plenty of statistics. Mr. Mann is here. He can read off those statistics for you very easily. But nevertheless, the structural problems are those that also we ought to talk about more. You need to be able to export more to earn more money. Our structures, how are they well geared for us to up up our exports? That is why some of the initiatives we're taking on the ground, diversifying uh, our, our basket of cash crops, creating um, enterprises at the grassroots level that would be allow us to grow and make things, things that we can then also find to export. The more currency that we're able to earn, the stronger our currency will be and the more stable it will be. We cannot escape that. That one is a matter of the market. And we don't want to go back to exchange controls and fix that. Because inevitably those are subverted by black marketeers and syndicates and speculators. So we are in the open market system and having to manage it within bounds, but always with this fundamental structural weakness that we have to address, and that is what we are trying to do. The banking crisis. In net terms, some 3,000 odd people have 
3,000 plus odd people have lost their jobs within the banking sector. There were 10,000 odd at the time we intervened. <coughs> My answer to you is very simple. If we hadn't intervened, all those 10,000 would have gone out of the window. The situation which we inherited when we came was that the banking system, unregulated, or very poor regulation, very poor government uh, governance practices amongst the banks, lots and lots of uh, irrecoverable debts, generally a, a very fragile, undercapitalized banking system. We had allowed it to continue for a day longer would have brought about the collapse of the financial system in our country and the banking system. And instead of losing 3,000 jobs, we would have lost 10,000 jobs, apart from the problems that we would have had with a, uh, with a, with a, a banking system in, 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 in pieces. I believe that the actions that was taken by the Bank of Ghana, the overdue actions that were taken by the Bank of Ghana with the support of the Ministry of Finance were appropriate. Yes. They have caused some dislocations and some difficulties, but we had no choice. We had no choice. Had we, if we had, in fact, delayed in acting, would have been would have been very much more condemned by history as being irresponsible in the face of that crisis than the interventions that we made. It is unfortunate. The banking crisis is unfortunate. The monies that are involved in trying to preserve these, the savings of four and a half million Ghanaians, 15, 16 billion CDs, that money could have found better use. No, let me use, don't let me use the word better use. But I could certainly imagine what it could have done for our roads, for our hospitals, for our, our schools, instead of it being sunk in trying to, 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 to shore up the system. It was not part that was not part of the, pro, the, uh, uh, the, the, the projections that we made when we were coming to office. Yes, Dr. Baumia, the Vice President, had, had alerted the country to the fragility of the banking system when we were in opposition. I think he even went so far as to identify that eight banks were threatened. It turned out that, in fact, Nine banks when the world was closed. So his, his, uh, his reputation as a prophet <laughs> is well deserved. But the extent of the damage, the extent of the problem, and the monies that were, would be required to repair and shore up the system, that one we did not have an idea of it when we came. And as I say, we're talking 15 billion CDs. In which we have, it's been poured into the system to shore up our financial system and as well as helping to increase and to the, the capitalization of the banks. That money could have been spent in other ways that would have brought, if you like, directly more benefits to our people. So I will have to once again, disagree with you. I believe that we had no option and that the manner in which we intervened was absolutely right. We could not have waited any longer and have yet to be, to be told of the model of rescue that would have, been, would have been preferable and more effective than what we did. I think that the what we did was essential and it was right that the efforts that are being made to make sure that people do not lose out of this exercise are ongoing. Those, the small savings in the, in the savings loans and microsystem, the provision that has been made makes it possible for 95% of depositors to be guaranteed of their monies. In the banking system too, the access of people to their monies is being guaranteed. In the process, we've had this net 
fallout in terms of those who are employed in the system. But it is the whole business of I make omelets without breaking eggs and all of that. It's unfortunate. But this is not a, it was not a situation of our creation. We inherited the situation. the situation. We inherited the situation because previous regulators of the system were not prepared to act when they should have done so. And that's why the thing grew and grew and the saw became bigger and bigger. We came to try and exercise it. Mr. President, thank you. We'll take the next batch of five. There's already a gentleman behind the microphone, so I'll take four more. And I want to stress, let's stick to it. Else then I have to interrupt you. Um, Yes, the gentleman in white here. Um, yes, sir. Latif, please come on. Well, they all end up being white. You have to be white. No, if they want to, you have to be white. <laughs> I want you to be recognized. <laughs> They turn it off. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Abid Yenim from Net2 TV. Um, your party is built on the property owning democracy, and this can be possible when you have um, livestock of affordable homes that makes sense to the ordinary people or working class people. So far, we haven't seen much of that under your government. Is there any hope going forward? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Kwekudeuru. I work with Kingdom FM under Unique Kingdom Communication. Um, we know, uh, or according to Transparency International, their local chapter, we lose around $3 billion to corruption annually, which is far higher than what we are leveraging our box sites for. Uh, under the Sino Hydro deal. Mr. President, in our country, punishing corruption to serve as deterrent is something we have not been seeing. I want to know the state of investigations and prosecution of some corruption cases or allegations which, are, which seems to be dying naturally. Key amongst them um, are the, some members of parliament who received, were alleged to have received double salary under the elsewhere administration. And then the other corruption allegations like the robbing the assemblies and key uh, bus branding and a host of others. Okay, we sir. want to know the state of the investigation and whether you are interested in prosecuting those cases Oh, no, thank you. Okay, so let me come to Latif here. Yeah. My name is Abdul Rahman. Hey, if you hold on just, just a moment. I'm taking a question from the side. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Um, Mr. President, uh, my name is Latif Idris. I report for Joy News. In a few weeks, you will be three years in office. If you look back to those three years and the kind of work that you have done over the period, and just suppose that against the recent Afrobarometer report that says you are not in the position to get a one-touch victory in the 2020 elections. Does that projection by the Afrobarometer discourage you or you think it's a fair representation of what you have done over the period? Thank you. So the question is, are you discouraged by the Afrobarometer report? AR. AR Gomda Dele Guy. The relationship between Ghana and Nigeria is an all-time high. But this all-time highness is being threatened by a few of our compatriots. Guta. Guta is cutting it. What are we doing about it? Although the president recently intervened with good counsel to Guta members, 
it has gone down, but not completely. It is festering. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Hokatechi, a FIFA Mensa from Happy FM. For the purposes of my target audience, may I have your permission to ask my question in three? Right. Mr. President, yes, yeah, yeah, Omaya, ye nini, a koye I yepese, ye yes, America for and UK Germany in terms of infrastructure. Now, so I did my I want to say, say, yeah, yeah, acquire. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. President, those are the five questions. First, on affordable housing. Second, on the state of uh, prosecutions into some specific matters, double salary, etc. Third is whether or not you are discouraged by the Afrobarometer reports. Fourth is what government is doing about the uh, Guta uh, Ampas. And the finally, the quality of roads. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the quality of road. Uh, it's easier. Um, yes, I think that it's a, a, a legitimate point about the roads that we have built in the past and uh, the various ancillary constructions that should go along with it. I believe that if you are taking note of what is being done now, both matters are being addressed, both the quality as well as the drainage systems of the roads that are being built right around now. You can see for yourselves, even in the roads that are being done here in Accra, Lekma Road, Pukwai, all of them, you can see for yourself that a new approach is being adopted. And I'm hoping that when that is over, we will see that in fact a change has been made and that we're getting a more permanent uh, road infrastructure that we've had up to now. Nigeria-Ghana relations. Yes, this is a, a, a very delicate and difficult issue. Um, but I think some things are, 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 are obvious. Guta are right in their uh, and, uh, interpretation of the laws of our country. The laws of our country, until they're changed, have made, have banned foreign people, foreigners, from engaging in the retail, retail trade in our country, as well as in activities in our markets. They've reserved those for Ghanaians. So if people who are not Ghanaians, who are known not to be Ghanaians, are in, involved in it. People are entitled to get agitated about it. What has what we need to do since this agitation is to be more rigid in enforcing the law, more strict about the enforcement of the law. And I'm hoping that the measures that have been put in place with the support of Guta as they begin to work now will make it possible, and therefore bring down the decibel level. The Nigerians cannot complain about our enforcement of our own laws. They're doing it in their country. So they cannot complain, and there'll be nothing discriminatory about it. If they're Chinese or the Nigerians and everything, they all of them should be part and parcel of the same pot in terms of the application of the law. Well, I think, I'm hoping that we have been able to put uh, uh, some kind of a handle on is people taking the law into their own hands. That is why I made that intervention with the Guta and 
his leadership, that they cannot take the law into their own hands and by, by that go out of the way to start closing shops and all of that. That one is, there's, there's, there's no future in that. We, and if people uh, take the law into their own hands over their own specific grievances, before you know we have anarchy and we don't have a state. So that one, I'm hoping that they have taken that into account. But at the same time, I think they have the onus on us, the state, to make sure that our laws are properly applied. I don't think we can escape those laws. And that we're going to make an effort to make sure that those laws are applied. And whilst we're doing this, I am keeping the lines open to our Nigerian uh, uh, brothers and, and, and leaders to let them know exactly what it is that we're doing and how we're going about it. Definitely, you will see some action in this area about our effort to. Uh, uh, but we, uh, by, by the converse, the closure of the border. You haven't brought that up. You should have brought it up. Yes, because that, that too is a big problem. There are over 300 Ghanaian trucks stuck on the border with, with, between Benin and, 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 and Nigeria perishable goods, some of them have had to record them, others are there going through very difficult circumstances. And we're also making all kinds of efforts to tell the Nigerians that this is not the way forward. We cannot have that as a permanent solution to the issue. So the discussions are on, and um, I think that the statement you made that the relations are at an all-time high is good. So it is, it is enabling us to have those discussions in a, in a constructive atmosphere. We can find solutions. I understand some of the problems that are on the Nigerians. You spend a lot of money trying to make yourself self-sufficient in rice. And then you see next door to you, large sums of rice are being imported by the country which are twice the amount of rice that any people in Benin can eat. Uh, the obvious implication is that this rice is destined for Nigeria, and then the Nigerians are clearly uh, alarmed about it. And I, but we have to find a better solution than border closures to deal with international trade. And I think that all of us need to try and work on that. Well, I hope you, fo you followed what has happened in London last night. I'm talking about afro barometer projections and polls, etc. I'm not discouraged. I'm not discouraged at all. Uh, but because my attitude to polls has never changed. The only poll that matters is the poll on the 7th of December. That's the only poll that matters. I'm not saying that when people do polling, you then just rubbish it. No, that's not my view. You have to look at it, take it into account, analyze it, and see for yourself what is being said. But we know of situations where lots of people did not predict my being here. There were polls that went to say that I couldn't be here. You know, I would never be here. I'm here. <laughs> you then, you then, uh, then have to worry. Uh, you have to worry yourself about one touch, no touch, whatever. But uh, no, I'm not discouraged. It's important, for me, what is important is my program and the work that I'm carrying out. Because I believe it is beneficial for the people of Ghana. And then when the time comes for the Ghanaian people to comment on it, I'm optimistic and go forward to say that I'm confident that it will be a good comment that they'll make on it on the 7th of December next year. So I'm not discouraged by their food programs at all. The prosecutions. Um, and some things, I think, escape us in our discussions. There are, unfortunately, and I don't take any particular joy in it, but there are things that you cannot escape. We have 25 people, persons, involved in the last administration who are on trial for various acts of malfeasance, financial impropriety, corruption, etc., as we speak. Not who are about to, but who are on trial as we speak. And the amount of monies involved collectively in those trials, 130 million odd dollars and some 287 million CDs. We're talking about over together uh, at, at, at today's figures, over a billion CDs involved in those trials. 
So it isn't as if nothing is happening. But then, and you read about it in the paper, applications here, applications here. So we want to do it within the context of due process. For me, it is extremely important. It's like these allegations that are made against, uh, uh, have, have been made against some of, uh, of, of my appointees. For some people, the allegation is enough to convict people. I don't believe that. Allegations have to be investigated. Either they're investigated at the level of police or whatever other institutions, and they're at the same time in the court. They have to be tried. And in the process of trying people, people are entitled to make applications to test this or that or that rulings. All of these things delay cases. But for me, it is a better system than summary trial of people. But people are given, because the thing about due process is that it is only when you are in trouble that you appreciate it. Yes, the rule of law concepts come into play and you appreciate it when you yourself are in problems. Then you see that really being given the opportunity to test this, to test that, to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. All those come into play. So as far as the state of prosecutions are concerned, much is already happening. There's several of the cases that are there, I think you know all about them, uh, Tuvo, Asian, Dukus, Sednatama Club, Afuboni, uh, Ernest Thompson, Opuni, all those trials are ongoing as we speak. The double salary, the members of parliament, it's, uh, uh, it is not a straightforward uh, an allegation of misappropriation, as some people think. There's a whole lot of double accounting, to what extent uh, people were taking money vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their, uh, their emoluments on the uh, Article 70 and all of this. And I'm thinking that unless the thing is really clear-cut, and it hasn't been made clear-cut to me, to arraign a whole lot of parliamentarians, and the list is quite long, to arraign a whole lot of parliamentarians on on a 50-50 on a, on a case. I, for myself, I don't think that we do, we do the public interest of our country in service in that way. So the process of seeing to what extent um, the set-offs can be there, it's been ongoing, it's not been easy, but there's a group that is doing that work. And when they finish, we will be in a position to uh, uh, let the country know what the final outcome of the double salary thing is. Um, yes, a lot of money. You use this figure, three billion dollars is lost annually. It's a, I don't know to what, how, how accurate it is, but let us even take it for granted that it is accurate. One of the reasons why it's possible is that we have a poorer system in our country. The capacity of the state to be able to act to protect itself by that the parliament itself, the judiciary, SHRAJ, the office of the attorney general. These are the accountability institutions and the auditor general. And sig significant amounts of money has gone into strengthening their capacity over the three years that I've been in office. In 2017, our first year, we increased the allocation to these accountability institutions by 25% over what there was in 2016. And in 2018, we witnessed a 34% increase over the allocation in 2016, and the same in 2019. So in this short period in which I've been in office, we've seen what, 60 to 70% increase in the budgetary allocations to these accountability institutions to strengthen their capacity to do their work. I mean, take the case of, 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 of Shrag. The operational budget of Shrag 
has increased from 16 million in 2016 to over 40 million in 2020. Because that is the path that I believe we have to go to strengthen the, uh, the capacity of the organizations. When you look at the, 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 the capacity of our police, of our uh, uh, Office of Attorney General, I mean, these are big sounding titles, Office of Attorney General. When you go into it and you break it down, you find a harassed small group of lawyers, badly paid, trying to do the best they can against a mountain of work. We need to give them more money. We need to pay them better. We need to find more money for them to be able to do their work. All those things are part and parcel of the struggle against uh, corruption. And that path, so long as I'm in office, we're going to continue down that path. We even had the Auditor General. I don't remember if you remember recently the Auditor General making these remarks about how um, facilities and resources have been given to the Auditor have been given to the Auditor General that had never happened in their history before. In fact, I have a, I have the quote. Where, when there was a change of government, the first announcement we had was a ban on procurement of vehicles. Is that not it? But this was the time government gave us a permission to buy 34 vehicles to support the audit service. We had never bought 10 vehicles in the history of the audit service before. These are the measures that we are taking to strengthen the accountability institutions in our country so that they can do their work more effectively. We can continue to shout as much as we like if the, the institutions that are meant to deal with corruption don't have the means and the capacity to do so, we'll be whistling in the dark. So, yes, we recognize the deleterious effects of corruption, but the will to do something about it is manifest in my case, I'm putting my mouth where my words are. Actually, you finding resources to be able to enable them to do their work well. And then I want to come to the final part of this matter. These accusations against my, my appointees. There is not one allegation that has been leveled against any of them that has not been investigated. And they're not investigated by me. I know there's a big cry in NDC circles that I'm Mr. Clare President. I, I don't clear anybody. I don't have the power to clear anybody because I don't have the power to investigate anybody. I'm not the one, I'm not an investigating agency. I'm a president. I'm an executive leader of the country. I don't do investigations. Investigations are done by strides. They're done by the parliament. They're done by the police. And when they give me a report that they have not found any basis for the allegation, I accept it because that is the way that our institutions have to work. And somehow or other, those who make the allegations say that the mere making of the allegation establishes the fact of corruption. I'm a lawyer. I'll never accept that way of doing business. So, Mr. The, uh, the corruption matter, these are the remarks I'd like to make. We need to focus on it. We have all of us to commit to doing something about it. There's the personal example. There's the institutional measures that we have to take. And in that exercise, I think we, we're all Ghanaians. We know what goes on in this country. And we all have to be part of the anti-corruption drive. It is not just a matter for the president. Yes, the president plays a very big role. He is the head of the executive of our nation. And he's, he should play the role. But the matter doesn't end just with him. But I think that if the focus is there, if we continue down the path, strengthening the institutions, raising the bar, and making sure that the, the language of, uh, of honesty, of integrity, is a prominent part of our public discourse, and then whenever people fall foul, foul, foul of the law that they're dealt with, and we do so without any political coloring, the difficulty, somebody comes and then the, the members of my administration uh, are then uh, are going to be, be, be examined. Then the cry immediately goes up, it's a witch hunt.
witch hunts are the other side of corruption or what? I don't understand. Let us all accept that we want a situation where prosecutors, investigators do their work without political coloring. Now the result of it is that if you are accused, you are given an opportunity for a trial before an independent court of judges of integrity who will examine your case. If you are found guilty, you are found guilty. If you are innocent, you are then set free. I think that that is the way we want to go. The affordable housing. I think the affordable housing projects that are very much on the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Works and Housing is falling over itself to initiate several uh, affordable housing schemes, as is also the State Housing Corporation. I went to commission some of the work that they, they have done recently in China. Uh, so it, it's, it's ongoing. The deficit is a lot. We have a housing deficit of over a million units. Making a dent on that is not something that is going to be done overnight, but you have to work on it systematically. And hopefully soon, we will be in a position to provide more and more and more accommodation for people. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, you are a champion of um, gender rights. I want to uh, be biased towards the ladies. Apparently, in our earlier selection, we haven't called enough. There was a lady in a spotted dress who we stopped earlier. Yes. There's another lady at the back. Um, if there are ladies, I'll take them now. Yes, yes, madam. Yes, madam. And yes, madam. That will be five ladies. And then we'll continue. The president is very gender sensitive. I don't want to get into trouble with him. Yes, madam. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, my name is Chaudi Deku from Diaspora Network Television. And I'd like to ask, the EC has boldly declared that if Ghanaians abroad do not vote in the 2020 elections, it will not be because of the EC, a statement that suggests the need for political will beyond the EC. Can you promise that political will to ensure the implementation of ROPA in 2020? Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm Beatrice Asamani Savage. I work for the Ghana News Agency. My question is, with regard to fight for the Ghana News Agency, my question is, with regard to fighting corruption, the issue of assets declaration and disqualification plays a key role. So I would like to know what efforts you're doing to get the bill before Parliament passed and then what the uh, Attorney General recently said about initiating efforts to back that so that the law becomes more effective and progressive. Thank you very much. Not sure, uh, anyway. Yes, madam. My name is Nanama Osei-Titu. I work with Kingdom FM in Accra. Mr. President, the opposition NDC says they are ready to engage you or your government on the referendum. Are you ready for them? <laughs> yes, let me take the final two from here. Mr. President, my name is Nane Sibwat and I work with the Man FM Maritime and Port News. Um, in 2016-2017, in such a forum, I asked about how your government is going to reduce duties as you were promising and as against your developmental issues. Now in 2019, we saw a giant step you took by cutting down 50%, um, the benchmark value 50% on import duties and 30% on vehicles. And this obviously brought some praise songs from the importers community. But um, as to how this slash of 50 and 30% is trickling down to the consumers is what I beg to differ, Mr. President. I would like to ask that when you make such policies or such reduction, what or how do you monitor to ensure that consumers, the ordinary members, the ordinary Ghanaians benefit from that? Because as I speak, um, a bag of rice that, that was bought 
around 180 Ghana cities in 2017. It's now being sold around one, uh, 250 Ghana cities, even as at this time when there is a 50% slash on import duties. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Good afternoon. My name is Atia Win Imbila Lawson. I'm a journalist with Star FM, part of the EIB network. 14 years ago, 44 Ghanaians were killed in the Gambia. At that time, you were the Minister of Foreign Affairs. This year, it was revealed during the Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Committee that the soldiers were acting on the orders of then President Yaya Jame. Mr. President, at that time, in 2005, when the incident happened, what did you do? And now that you're president of the Republic of Ghana and this new evidence has come to light, what are you going to do about it? Good afternoon, Mr. President. That'll be a sixth question, but go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Amma Kwampa. I work with Eclipse Broadcasting Network, EBN. My question is about the uh, year of return. So seeing that the red carpet has been rolled out for the African diaspora for the year of return celebrations, is there a way we can ensure that regardless who is president, uh, Ghana continues to reap the benefit of this great initiative? Thank you. Beyond the return. Okay. Well, let me start from the last one. Really, we ought not to make this thing a one-off should be a permanent feature of our outreach, both in terms of using it as a, a vehicle for solidifying, solidifying the relations on both sides of the Atlantic, between the Africans on the other side of the Atlantic and ourselves, and also, of course, what it does also for our tourist revenues. So the, both the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture and the Ghana Tourism Authority have also developed a new instrument, call it Beyond the Year of Return, a birthright, which is a whole set of programs between us on this side and they on the, in, in, the, in the Americas and in the Caribbean. In, in, in the Americas and in the Caribbean. So the, the question that, you are, that you've asked is already being addressed. The Beyond the Year of Return of Birthright is a program that is being put in place so that we can continue with the momentum that the Year of Return has generated and find a way of institutionalizing the, the relationship. Uh, the things that are already happening apart from this year, for instance, this film that is about to be aired, the Joseph the film about Joseph, which is a tribute to Tanko Bechabilanti and uh, all that. These are all is the instruments that are being fashioned to enable us to, to, to do what it is that you're seeking. Um, Gambia. The people involved were killed in the Gambia. When I went in 2005, it was to find that, to establish the circumstances. I came away with a clear understanding that there was complicity on the part of the then Gambian authorities in what had been done. It was very difficult because the, 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 the power arrangements then didn't permit the full investigation, but that was my clear And then I made the report to the parliament as to the work that I had done in trying to ask to, to un unearth the problem. Now, these um, revelations that have come basically should lead the Gambian authorities to institute, to instigate the trials. I've spoken to the president of the Gambia on this matter. And his attitude was, you know, the position that we're in is brand new, what we're trying to do, things are still insecure, please give me time. <laughs> So we will we'll continue to work with them. Um, uh, doing something about it here would be to go and get hold of President Jame in Malibu and bring him here to our crowd. Unfortunately, I don't have that kind of authority and that kind of power. 
but in making sure that the authorities in the Gambia try and do something about it, we continue to to stress it and, 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 and talk to them about it. And hopefully, when they feel that the circumstances in their country, the stability they're seeking is more secure, they may be persuaded to act on the matter. Um, the monitoring. Yes, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important contribution how we can make sure about the monitoring. But I think that some of these things are also have a little bit to do with the, with, with the, uh, the depreciation of our currency, which translates itself in this um, uh, increase in prices. But uh, once again, the structural answers, we should stop importing rice and, buy and eat, eat our own rice. Yes, we should stop importing rice and eat our own rice. And I'm hoping that very soon, when we are satisfied about uh, uh, our capacity, we will ban it. Then the matter of increasing the bag of rice was not a rice at all. You eat Ghanaian rice and finish with it. The National Democratic Congress says they're prepared to engage me on the referendum. Um, well, nobody has told me that. I'm not hearing it <laughs> for the first time. But I, I will also investigate it. And we'll see. Uh, Maybe a bit late to restore the referendum now. It's currently, the date is what? Tuesday. The original date was Tuesday. And all the formal processes have been withdrawn. But really, I, but I, I understand it to mean that they're prepared to engage about the future. About, about the provision, and I am very, very, very open to that, very open. We should have that kind of dialogue. Uh, the asset declaration, I'm not quite sure I understand what is being proposed in the question about those, is it a new asset? There is already an asset declaration law. Is it the issue of publishing or what? Is that such a law? I don't believe there's any such bill in Parliament. I'm not aware of any such bill. I mean, there are two things. When you say do the review more often, the, in, in principle, it's every four years. When you go in, you file, and when the four years is going out, you file again, and that provides the review. But you're talking about publishing. The, to make what shorter? Ah, okay, 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 okay. I'm understanding you better. Then. But I'm not aware of any such law. Then uh, we'll, we'll find. But um, do I support such a law? I think that I think that on, on, on I mean, for instance, on the publication, I was all for it. And, um, uh, even before I came here, I was all for it. The idea that it should be published. A whole lot of very very important people in Ghana say, no, 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 no. That one it cannot happen. It's not the Ghanaian way. We can't, we can't have that. And you, you can imagine what is being suggested, that your nephew knows how much money you have. <laughs> for some people, it's a prescription for, for chaos. <laughs> for so all of these things, you have to be able to do it in context. I mean, it's something like that if it's happening. For me, in Parliament, we have to do it on the basis of a free vote. Everybody to go there and go, go and do it on the basis of their country. But I'm not aware of any such law. Okay. And the final question is on the implementation okay. of RUPA. Yes, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the statement that is attributed to the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. RUPA was passed as far back as President Kufo's time. And until now, we, are being, we, are, we were told by her predecessors that they didn't, they didn't believe the machinery existed for the implementation of the law. And until that machinery came to be, they wouldn't implement it. Because the 
the administration of elections is a matter of the electoral commission. It has nothing to do with the government. I mean, government comes into it when it comes to budgetary uh, demands from the electoral commission. That is the extent. But the system that we have had, and I think it's a, it's a good system for all of us, is that presidents have helped those who organize elections. We never get any change in uh, <laughs> what's the case. So that is not, that, 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 that. so I'm not quite sure I understand what statement she said it will not be. She has to make up her mind whether she's capable of doing it or not. And I believe there's a committee in place that is examining the feasibility of it as far as this year's election is concerned. That's what I understand to be the reality. But that, that would be my, my response. Mr. President, we'll take a final batch. Okay. Um, Mr. Pratt, I saw your hand up earlier. Do you still have a question? Oh, it's been answered already. So I'll take Mr. Pratt. I'll take Obi. I saw the sports group with a hand up here. Songo, I'll take Songo. Um, I think Fortune. I see Bloomberg, a call from Bloomberg. And um, Mr. Aban, I'll give Mr. Aban a question. Thank you. Thank you.